There are so many voices here that people can create their own unique things. And yet there is still this cultural that's still lingering from the past that somehow the answers are in the West. Mm. And trust me, they are not. So the West also confused and looking for their way to figure out things. And so the main inspiration for Yana TV was to create this particular platform where we can showcase the voices of Asian movers and shakers, which means people who are doing interesting things, who are standing up, who want to speak up, challenging status quo and the norms, who are regional, who are thought leaders. And I also feel it is time. There has to be a bigger platform where we can all go and see who are the people who are doing amazing things here. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and everyone wants to make a difference in the emerging economies of the Asia Pacific region and be a change maker. What inspires people to work towards becoming change makers? With me today, Yana Fry, producer and host of Yana TV, and executive business and life coach, as well, to tell her about her new project. Yana, welcome to the show. Bernard, thank you so much for having me. Yes, first of all, I need to thank you for inviting me to your show. I don't know how that interview is going to go, but I, when you publish it, you let me know and we will happily to share it there. And today we're going to talk about you because you have been interviewing a lot of change makers. I've seen your LinkedIn posts. Um, they have talked about their life stories, how they try to create a difference within their own communities, within the Asia Pacific itself. So we want to start with your origin story. How do you start your career? This is a $1 billion question. Actually, I wanted to be an actress and I was a child and teen actor. And then my parents said, it's not a serious profession. And they sent me to business school and which I really disliked. Yet I finished, I completed my university. And then just the way how my life unfolded, I started traveling around the world a lot. And so my career actually started quite late. Usually people start just right after university. But for me, I got married very young first, and I had like a really dramatic, you could say, marriage in a way, which took a lot of my time and energy into this. So only in my late 20s, I was actually able to fully go to the workplace because before I was a caregiver to my late husband. And so my career started, I think, when I was only 27 or 28, when I came to Asia, when I came to Singapore. And I said, okay, I want to take, you know, life in my own hands. And here I am in a foreign country, foreign culture, looking entirely different. And I still want to do what I want to do. So what brought you to Singapore and what are your perspectives like after living here and exploring also the other parts of Asia after 15 years, right? The last I yes, remember. Yes, exactly. Well, I came here for family reasons in 2008. And as I always joke that it was not love from the first sight with Singapore. So honestly, I struggled with weather, with food, with culture, with people, with mentality. I have never been to Asia before. It was like, so I moved right away into something I didn't know at all. And it was very interesting. If life just wants to keep you somewhere, it keeps you. I tried to live every year for five years and it yet life would redirect and keep me in Singapore. And now look at me, 15 years later, I am a Singapore citizen. I am very well integrated into the society and I work with a lot of both expats and local people. And just to answer your question, so what sort of makes maybe Singapore different or uh, Asia in general, uh, that's actually a topic which I'm very passionate about. And it's also a lot what we talk during Yana TV interviews just creating this breach and gap between East and West. Mm. And you are also a executive business and also a life coach. So, so that is also part of what you do as part of this, just engaging different business leaders, change makers within the region as well. And this was actually my original profession. So when I said that when I was in my late 20s, and I went into the workforce. So I actually went into my first coaching school, which feels now ages ago. And I become certified in a variety of modalities when it comes to executive coaching, leadership development, facilitation, speaking, team building, and also life coaching. Because as we joke, 
You know, when you go and talk to CEOs and founders, any coaching session, any business coaching session after the third session is always life coaching. So there's a common joke among coaches about it. <laughs> and so because it's all interconnected, right? And perhaps because they have been doing it now for so many years, I just have a tremendous network of people I know. So when Yana TV was launched, it was relatively easy for us to get guests on the show. Mm. So from your own career journey, given that you started your career at 27, what are the interesting lessons that you can share with my audience about your career journey? I love this question. Well, first of all, I think that it's important to listen to what you really want and tune out all the noise. Because I remember when I started, a lot of people told me it's not possible. You know, I mean, just, you know, just if you think about it, here I am in my late 20s. I am a young, white, inexperienced girl in Asia, which is a very traditional and people like to build relationships, you know, usually for a very long period of time. And especially with things like coaching, it's a lot about trust. So people need to know you and they need to trust you. And no one knew me when I came to Singapore. So people told me it's just, it's a dream. Just get a job, you know, in a company, be like everyone else, but you're trying to do, no one going to hire you. <laughs> And that was a very interesting one because, you know, eventually I proved them wrong <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and proved, I guess, myself right in what I knew that the best career for me. So I would say what is really important, just do what you believe is your path. And right now, when I look around in general, there are so many different varieties of career paths. Like even 10, 15, 20 years ago, it was not as much as it is. So right now, you literally can be anything you want to be. You just have to be very clear what it is that you want to do. <laughs> wow. Okay. So you have to be clear with what you do and you just have to focus on that exactly. one thing and one thing and only. Don't, exactly. And don't listen. Don't listen to people around you unless they support your vision of who you want to become. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's that's a good inspiration. No, no, yeah. <laughs> so I want to get to the main subject of the day, which is actually Tell talking me. about Yana TV. And also, I also want to understand how, what do you think about change makers in the Asia Pacific region as a whole? So the first question I probably have to ask, because at first you asked me to do this interview and I went and do the interview and then I, I didn't realize that there's something even bigger with what you are do, actually doing. So the first question I probably have to ask is what's the inspiration behind uh, Yana TV? Yes, after being in Asia for 15 years, what I observed is that there are not enough Asian voices that are being seen, that they're being heard, that they're being showcased. And I remember to me, it was very interesting. Someone who has lived in Europe and I used to live in US before. So when I came to Asia and I started talking with people, all kinds of people, professional people, you know, parents, uh, government people, all kinds of people. And uh, if I ask them, what do you actually listen to? What do you read? What do you watch? And people would tell me what kind of content they consume. 99% it would be Western content, particularly American. And to be honest, to me, it was a great surprise. Like I didn't expect it because I find Asia to be very diverse, very talented. There are so many voices here that people can create their own unique things. And yet there is still this cultural that's still lingering from the past that somehow the answers are in the West. Mm. And trust me, they are not. So the West also confused and looking for their way to figure out things. And so the main inspiration for Yana TV was to create this particular platform where we can showcase the voices of Asian movers and shakers, which means people who are doing interesting things, who are standing up, who want to speak up, who becomes a challenging status quo and the norms, who are regional, who are thought leaders. And I also feel it is time. There has to be a bigger platform where we can all go and see who are the people who are doing amazing things here. Mm. So who is the intended audience then behind Yana TV then? Is it people who are aspiring, young people who want to also be change makers or maybe even people who are now in their mid-careers thinking about transition or everything? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, this is great because, you know, also as uh, someone who is hosting a show, you set an intention and then the audience tells you and then the people come to you and sometimes you are surprised. So, right. so, so with Yana TV, it has been interesting because when we started, I thought mm. again, well, maybe it's going to be like an aspirational show, right? So here are those 
great people who are doing great things. And exactly what you said, someone who wants to be there will watch, will get inspired, will learn some tips. But actually, what is happening in reality when we look at our statistics for the for the age and you know location and professions? So we tend to attract very mature professional audience, which for me was also very interesting. So it looks like change makers themselves want to meet each other. So they come on the show, they're like, wow, I like this kind of people. And then they stay and they start checking videos and they're sharing with friends. So it's actually becoming more community of movers and shakers themselves who want to connect and network and get to know each other. Mm. Since we are on this professional track here, right? Do you think that those professionals who are interested is also because I think we went through a pandemic some time back, and then people have sort of reevaluate. We think we talk about the great resignation, now the great return to office <laughs> and everything. Is it that perspective of now just thinking about what you want to do? I think a lot of people in Asia is very busy, right? I don't know what they're busy with, but they're very, very busy. But they never really take a step back and think about their life and what they really want to do. I think, yes. To answer simply your question, when those people come on the show, because again, we're talking about professional people like yourself who come on the mm. show. And what for me, again, surprises me each time, how much they talk about life actually. And then, you know, like you invite, I don't know, like I invite someone who maybe runs a multi-billion business and then that's talking about kids and crying on camera and saying how much she loves the kids. Or mm. maybe a woman who would be talking like a middle life crisis or maybe how she was a career woman for 20 years and then decided she wants to be a mother, right? So, so it's interesting how people now merging, I feel also business and life together. And perhaps like before the pandemic, there was this race that we mm. are all the racing, you know, more, bigger, better, more money, yeah. right? Higher job, so more clients. And then people realize that life is also about other things. And so now what I see that everyone wants to have a balance and they also see this on social media because then all of those people who come on the show, we get connected. I see what they post, they repost their interviews and also what they actually talk about. And they all talk about life-work balance. So everyone wants, you know, to be successful and spend time with the family and be healthy and be a good parent, which I find wonderful trend. Yeah, maybe that is the silver lining after the pandemic. So, I think so. <laughs> um, I think one interesting thing I'm pretty curious, like what are the main teams that have sort of emerged from these interviews in Yan TV? You talk about professionals taking off their hectic life now, spending more time with family, trying to maintain their work-life balance. I'm sure there are other things that also emerged uh, as interesting topics of conversation, maybe philosophy, maybe what they think about their work, what their inspirational goals as well. Yes. Absolutely. And I think to answer this question, first, I need to tell who are the people that we are actually inviting, because we also sort of spontaneously found a very interesting group of people. And there are like a different subgroups in this, right? So there are professionals, exactly what we talked about. So people who come and they would largely talk about business and those said they want any aspect of business. Mm. So it could be entrepreneurs, it could be serial entrepreneurs, it could be executive who work for big companies, it could be CEOs of big companies. So there's the whole business world. And then they come and they talk about business and life and family, right? But that's one aspect. Then there are also people who are more diplomats or in politics. We also start having more and more requests. So which for me means that we are doing something right. Because, you know, if a diplomat PR offers approves actually the interview and they reach out and they want to come on the show. So it means that there is enough respect and, you know, for them to actually come and share the story. And so let's say if a diplomat comes, then it's a lot just about the diplomatic life. So we don't talk about politics, just to be very clear. Mm -hmm. Like we don't mm -hmm. take any sides about politics itself. It's more people behind the politics and what is happening and how they live their lives. And, and what it takes to make decisions, which are hard sometimes to make. So it's a more human element here. Then we have this the whole uh, spectrum of what they call like an entertainment. So people who are actors or singers or TV personalities or hosts. So those who are faces we, we see on the screen or hear on the radio, their voices, we see somebody on Tatla magazine. So and then yeah. they come. And they would usually talk about their career and also like what has changed over the years in the career 
and most of them would be Asians probably, right? So also this interesting perspective, how many more opportunities right now people have in Asia and how much more difficult it was even just 20, 30 years ago to actually make career in those, especially international career. So those are interesting stories. It just becomes sort of more like a just reflection on life and lessons that people learned, right? We kind of talk mm -hmm. about this. And then there are some people that we call it's ordinary people with extraordinary stories. The stories are just like, for example, we had one guy on the show who has been seven times to prison in Singapore. So he kind of went in the crime world in his teens, comes from a very difficult background. And then only in his 40s, he sort of realized that he wants to go integrate in the society and, and kind of get clean and stay alive. And he became like a spokesperson for inmates. Mm -hmm. And he built now this entire, you know, brand sort of around it. And so when he came on the show and shared his story, the whole team was crying behind the camera because mm -hmm. it was so touching, right? Like stories like this. So we have like a woman who became a national athlete for Singapore, actually, also in her mm -hmm. 30s. And it's quite late. Like those who in sport would know, usually if you want to be a professional athlete, you start when you're a teenager. And she didn't do that. So, but then her motivation was she wanted to show to her daughters that everything mm. is possible. And she became very successful and recognized. Mm. So both you and I are content creators. We have our own YouTube, social media presence, and we have friends, etc. One One interesting thing I always like to ask is how, how do you put together each episode? And maybe you can describe a bit of the production process. I went through... The process it was very smooth. It was very seamless. It was an interesting conversation. We were really having a conversation in a great studio that was there. So I, I want to sort of just get an understanding of the process from you then. Sure. And here first, I would like to say that I have been interviewing people since 2015. Like uh -huh. I know that your podcast has been now around also for a very long time. So you would understand, right? So mm. the more you do it, I guess the more relaxed you become at it. Like I yeah. remember when I started in 2015, I was very nervous on camera and mm. I, I was nervous I'm going to forget something. <laughs> and so it, it was much more sort of preparation just for the structure. But because now I have been doing it for so many years, it becomes like a skill. Like being mm -hmm. an interviewer is a skill. And so when we start, I mean, first, of course, it is with the guest selection. And some people reach out to us directly, some people I reach out to. So it depends who is the person and what kind of topic and what kind of world they're coming from. And then once the person is confirmed, so it means that they need to have something interesting to share. Like, so it has to be something, an unusual life story or an interesting life lesson. Or like, I mean, they need to be interesting on camera. That, that's very important. Like interview with you was great, for example, Bernard. I'm really looking forward, you know, to release that. And mm. then so once we confirm that, so we confirm the person, we confirm the story. I tell them that when they come on Yana TV, they should think about it as a conversational TED talk. Mm. Because the recording, the final recording is only 20 minutes. And we need to fit everything in this 20 minutes. So we prepare. And then the way how we do that, uh, we actually have a Zoom call. It's about mm. maybe 30 minutes with each guest. And I think you and I also had it, right? Mm, yep, so right. first of all, I feel that it helps just to establish connection, especially if I don't know the person, a person doesn't know me. So we don't come just cold on camera and just meeting in a studio. It's important to meet before and just have this feeling who we are as people and connect on a human level. And also then we talk about the story. I actually don't give people prepared questions because yeah. I personally like, you know that, right? People sometimes ask and they say, sorry, we don't do that because I want their natural reaction on camera. And, and, and that's why sometimes people cry or get emotional or they share something they didn't think they would have, they would share, but then they just end up still talking about it, right? So our preparation is more storyline. So when the person, when we have this preparation call, we just agree, okay, so what's going to be the storyline? What are the mm. important messages you want to share? G tell me about your life. What are the key points which would be interesting? And I always tell them, it is not about you. It is about the audience. Every time when you share something, let's say if you share a personal story, you still have to make it relevant to people because it's about them. It's about the audience. If you share your own lesson, then you have mm. to make it relevant to them. And so that's how we prepare with the content. I see. So 
given that content making process, right? So the show emphasizes change makers and unsung heroes. And I think you talk about some of the examples that you've given earlier. One interesting thing I would probably want to sort of just dive a little bit deeper is can you talk about, say, the different guest profiles in a way on how do you use your medium to illustrate their stories? For example, the diplomat example is very good because it sort of highlights like it's not about what they do, but what, how do they interact? How do they think about life, life lessons and their sort of relationship with their kids? Exactly, exactly. Well, to give maybe some other examples with people, right? So let's mm. say if it is a business person who is coming in, actually mm. the first thing I tell them, it is not a sales pitch. So just to be very clear, so you cannot just go on camera and go for 15 minutes, how amazing your company is and how much money you raise. We are not going to do that. So mm. I tell them all sales speeches are out of the question entirely because I have been content creator now for more than 10 years. So I know no one cares about sales pitches except investors, which are in a specific room, which is very important. But here we are talking more about reaching wider audience. Mm. So Yana TV, it's like a PR opportunity when people just want to be seen and known by more people and people outside, they want to hear human story. They don't want to mm. have like a dry facts about what this company did and how much money you raised and do you know what your clients did. This is too technical, right? So people mm. want to have human connection. That's why with business people, often we actually work on the sort of human element of their story, right? I'm like, okay, I understand you're a CEO, you are founder, but actually how do we make you relatable, right? So that's the question so that you don't become that person somewhere at the top of the mountains that no one mm. else can reach. And this is actually one of the reasons why we have so many requests, I think, particularly from business crowd, because that seems to be a very trendy topic. And especially business leaders understand that they, they need to be relatable and it becomes part of their PI and marketing, right? And so that's why then we just find something interesting in their human story that we can share. And everything around business is being weaved in into the conversation. So again, it doesn't come across as like a sales pitch in the camera. It's more hints, you know, mm -hmm. here and there. And from my, it's like, you know, when they say the best way when you do uh, like advertisement, it should not look like an advertisement, right? <laughs> so uh, so agree, that's kind of, right? And that's kind of what we are focusing on. They're still talking about what they do, but just in a very sort of uh, relatable way. So that's, mm -hmm. for example, the profiling. I'm mm, not sure, did I, I answer your question with no, that? No, it answers the question. <laughs> and then you, you started to make me think about when I interview uh, business uh, executives, entrepreneurs, people who are within doing technology, business and media in Asia. And then they have a very well-defined set of narrative that they want to talk about. And half my job is to try to figure out what are the insights I can draw from them without being a scoop because I'm not interested in scoops. I'm not interested in in making them look bad. But what I'm really interested in is really to help them to bring that insight out. How was it to understand the, the business environment in Asia? So that, that definitely resonated with me when you talk about the way you not giving them the questions, figure them out, and then try to sort of bring the human side of them within the interview. And, exactly. And, it, and you know, just, just maybe to add here, because I also find it is important. And the reason why we don't give them the question, I tell them that I, I might also challenge them on camera. Because I say, mm -hmm. look, I mean, no one wants to watch boring interviews. There is so <laughs> much content right now. So if the idea is that you want more people to share, to interact, to comment, to engage, it's not just presenting content. You also have to present it in a way which is interesting. So sometimes I ask that questions. <laughs> <laughs> mm, top questions is important, but I have a m different question that I want to ask. I, I think because you have interviewed so many different people from different backgrounds, how do the culture and say diversity of Asian change makers differ from the global narratives? And maybe I think it also addressed to why you started this TV series this ad, and why is that important? Actually, to me, it became important when I became a Singapore citizen. Ah. You know, because it was someone who I was born in Eastern Europe. And as I said, mm. I used to live in, in like Central Europe before and in America before I came to Asia. But what is interesting, Singapore, and I have been traveling more than 20 years around the world, right? So mm. Singapore was the only place where I truly felt like home and like I belong. 
And it does not matter that I look different, that my skin color is different, that I speak a different language, maybe believe, you know, a different religion, right? Mm. So no one cared about it. People just wanted to know me as me, as Yana. And that was just so empowering and liberating and very touching so that mm. I decided eventually to become a Singapore citizen. And I mean, I'm kidding you not. When it was a very, for me, it was a very emotional uh, ceremony when one of the Singapore ministers would give a speech, you know, when they give you a passport, right? They welcome you. Mm. And I still remember how he, and unfortunately, I don't remember the name of the gentleman. I would have to look it up. But I still remember how he was saying that there are two ways how you can look at the nationality. Like one nationality when you want to be united based on your language, your religion, your upbringing, your skin color, your past, pretty much your traditions. And mm. that's how most nationalities work, right? And the other way when you want to unite based on your skills and your talents and your values and where you want to hide in the future, and it does not matter where you come from, as long as you believe in what we all believe in collectively, and then we're going to create that. And this is what Singapore is about. And so to me, that was everything I sort of needed to know about Singapore. And I also found it's very forward thinking and future focused. And so when we started Yana TV, it became very important to me that we showcase the variety of voices. And I'm trying to be as, as particular as I can about it. Right. So we have people of different backgrounds, different education, maybe level, of course, different genders. These days you have all mm. kinds of things. So different religions, different languages, different belief systems so that it's it reflects what Singapore is about. So when we talk about Asia, then also it is as inclusive as we possibly can. And we keep expanding this inclusion. Mm. And after all, this region is almost uh, two thirds of the population. So that 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 amount of diversity is really it keeps on exploring. I I myself say that I come, I'm an Asian, but then when I think about going to different countries, meeting different cultures, I see something very different. I still see things that I do not know. Right, the curiosity exactly. of trying to f- figuring out. You know, sometimes it's like, oh, I didn't know that they have such a cuisine, such a way of thinking about something. You know. When you, exactly. When you and, and, you know, also part of your question was sort of how does it, you know, reflect on the global scale, mm, right? Like when right. you look at yeah, specifically yeah, yeah. at Asia and in my experience, just working with all these people and talking with them, I find Asian people to be much more inclusive and welcoming in general. So they're curious about each other, especially those who are educated and well-traveled and, you know, have seen the world. It's exactly what you said. They would want to go to different country and they want to learn. They would meet Asian from a different country and they want to understand. And unfortunately, I don't always see that in the Western world. So I wish there were more inclusion and understanding. <laughs> so I well, think we can, I mean, I think as a Western born person, I could say we can work on that and we should work on that. <laughs> so I spent seven to eight years in Europe, living in the UK, but traveling around Europe. So I'm now one seventh of my life was being in Europe, actually understanding the cultures there. So and then thinking about how to even navigate across. So it did help me a lot when it comes to working for like a company like Airbus, when, you know, it's a very European culture. What challenges do you think are pretty unique to Asian change makers. I mean, I always make the joke that a lot of Chinese parents only have steaks, no carrots. <laughs> and, it's a funny and, and, one. And, and there is that, you know, they want them to be professionals, but you want to do something totally different from Korea. I just had an entrepreneur who came on the show and said that, you know, he was the first to quit school and started the company. So I, I think this is, I, I want to hear from you because you talk to more people than I do. So what kind of challenges are unique to Asia change makers and how do they really navigate them as well? I would definitely agree with you that parents absolutely big yes in terms that exists. I, I don't want to call it a problem, right? But this situation exists. And if I would happen, especially an Asian change maker, and because on the Yana TV, we also have experts who mm. have been living in Asia for ah. 10, 20, 30 years. So they don't have to be Asian origin, but they kind of okay. became like a naturalized Asians, right? That's right. But, but if we talk about specifically people of Asian origin, Religion, then absolutely family, not just parents, the whole family. So you talk about Chinese, I mean, what about Indian family, right? Also, there's all sorts of jokes about just expectations, especially for the firstborn son, which is the same like would be in China, in Thailand, I mean, and many, many, many countries around here. 
And so that's the scarce. But then the other one, which to me also, I was surprised to hear that from so many people because I thought that the world worked through that, but apparently not, is actually discrimination towards Asians, mm. which is still very present. And, you know, people talk about that. It. It's at the workplace, it's in life, in the creative field, especially if you want to go internationally. So maybe it was not as strong as it was 50 years ago, but apparently it is still quite strong and people are very mindful of that. And those are growing up people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s who are sharing stories how they still face it at work. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, right? Mm. So it just is the fact that you are Asian. And then if you start dealing internationally with the Western world, sometimes sort of discrimination could be direct in your face and people actually say things. And sometimes it is indirect politics, which are behind your back. And so that, I think, something that people from this part of the world still have to navigate it. And it's maybe a bit harder then to succeed internationally rather than if you're born in the West. But also it is changing, and that's why I see more and more people coming together. Like, you know, the, the power mm. in numbers, right? Mm. So Asia, there are a lot of people in Asia. It's probably the most populated part of the world. And so when people actually unite in uh, what they believe in and their values and, and, and where they want to go, I find no one can stop them. And I see right now there are more and more clubs opening for Asians that are like a dedicated also shows and podcasts only for Asian voices. And there are, there are all kind of networking opportunities and people sometimes want to specifically support each other, including invest money in the company or give a job because the person is Asian, right? So there's also this support, which I find is, you know, interesting and it's really good to see. And maybe just one, so we take parents, discrimination, right? And then the other third one, which I also found interesting, given that we are in Singapore, mm. and we also sort of talk from here, when I talk to people, especially those who maybe grew up in Singapore, then they often say that they need to travel. Like to become really successful, they have to get out of Singapore, travel, live in other countries, study somewhere, and kind of experience the rest of the world. Because Singapore is so comfortable that it's almost like too ideal, right? So like I always mm. love, you kind of have to graduate to be able to live in Singapore after you have done everything else. So that if you do it from a younger age, then there's maybe not enough anything around you to form your character. So you have to go and live in other country and experience and face those challenges and also become maybe more just integrated into the world and more open-minded about things, right? So many Singaporeans have been saying that, that if you want international success, you have to get out and then you can come back later. <laughs> yeah, that's the essential. Even when I was giving briefings to educators who, when I was working for St. Paul's, when they came to hear us to talk about how we do the transformation. And one of the things I appeal to the educators is you should tell your students that they should try to live some time in overseas saying really understanding how different cultures work. Because what the challenge is, is that there are not enough executives within a lot of Singapore companies who could fill the hit and lead roles across the different parts of the world. Hence, uh, denying them of that experience that they can actually grow further in their careers. I want to get to this point about, and I'll exclude myself being the disclaimer I'm on your show. Can you share some pretty interesting, like surprising stories about the change makers you interviewed Describing that how unique they are. Yes. Well, that was we kind of started, okay? This conversation already. So let me maybe continue with just a few more mm. more details. Like for example, I mentioned to you the story of a diplomat, right? Mm. So when he came on camera, so to me, but I didn't know about him, but he shared this on camera that when in one of the postings that he had before Singapore, he was in Libya and there was like a lot of just unrest and a war oh kind gosh, of right yeah. situation. And he was kidnapped. And so and then and then he said, so so he said, look, and, and it was so he came, he was released eventually, and he came mm. home mm. and he called his friend who was another diplomat at a different posting. And his question was, basically what he said was, look, I have just been kidnapped and it's fine. We sorted it out. I'm home. I'm safe right now. But I need to ask you, do you think it's normal? Is it part of our job? 
Like, do, do I need to get my kids out of the country? You know, is it crossing the line? Right? Mm-hmm. So that was interesting to me how sort of safety, how much we can stretch it when mm-hmm. we do different kind of jobs, right? And sometimes things which may be perceived to be very unsafe, the majority of people become normal if you are like in a, in a situation like this, right? Or in a That's job right. like that. Mm-hmm. So that was, for example, a very interesting story, which I didn't expect. Totally to hear, uh, you know. Then the other one was actually something entirely different. <laughs> we we had on the show a person who we call the Singapore Santa Claus. It was before the Christmas. So okay. and the guy, so the guy came like in a full Santa Claus, you know, costume to the mm-hmm. amusement of the whole crew. And so if I thought it's gonna be like one of those jolly, you know, Merry Christmas type of interviews about how great things are. And and then this guy goes on camera and I ask him so pretty much the question you ask me now. I said, D- can you please share with us a story when you visited mm-hmm. one of the family that you really remembered? And everyone was, of course, expecting something with maybe 10 children who were laughing and running around and 100 presents. And what the guy said, he said, there's one story that still stays with him because a family reached out and they had a very sick child. And so they booked him to come, you know, as a Santa for Christmas, Mm -hmm. right? And the child was so sick, it passed away a few minutes before he actually arrived. So when he came home, the child was no longer alive. It was just lying in bed. And he said he didn't even realize at first. Like when he showed up, he thought maybe sleeping because they did mention that he was quite ill, right? So he performed sort of the whole Santa Claus thing to the child that was no longer there. But for parents, it was such a moving experience because that was the final wish of their child to actually see the Santa. And so for them, it was an incredible, you could almost say healing moment when they felt they fulfilled it, right? But mm. then for, for the guy itself, for the guy who is the Santa itself, I mean, that was yeah. something he will never forget. I mean, That's that right. was like such a, just totally unexpected. And I didn't expect him to share this. Again, everyone was in tears when he was sharing it, you know, in details. Mm. And it is also not something you associate with the profession of Santa Claus. Mm. So I guess I'm just sharing this, that what I learned interviewing all those people Mm. That reality is never what we think it is. Like when we look at someone, right? And maybe a person has some kind of job and maybe lifestyle and we assume things. We assume that this is maybe this is their life or maybe this is how their career is going. We never know what is really happening. And actually it just kind of keeps teaching me over and over and over again the importance of kindness and compassion and just suspending the judgment. So people are people and we all have our stories. And I think this is how we connect. Mm. And that intersects very well with you just saying as a business coach, after three times, it becomes a life coach. Exactly. Because <laughs> Every time. Is, yeah, because you're actually <laughs> getting in more in depth about the person beyond the stereotype. I think the, the problem with when we talk to people, we have some unconscious way of even stereotyping them, but actually we should need to remove away that stereotype and just talk to them the way as it is. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and if you sort of talk about especially things like business and executive coaching, I think that's why it actually works and why people come and they pay money that they pay. Because mm. from my, especially in Asia, actually, when you look at people who are like a C-suite leaders or who founders or who CEOs, I mean, they're like gods, often to thousands of people. You know, again, particularly in the Asian culture, no one is, and especially if a person happened to be male. No Mm. one would question your judgment. You know, no one would really uh, sort of challenge you and sort of say, are you sure this is the right decision, right? Mm. So did you consider everything? And so one of the reasons why they come actually for business and executive coaching, because they want to be challenged. They want someone to sort of not to look at them as their title, but look mm. at them as people who also still, regardless of their position within the company or, or government, right? So they would mm. still have their own fears and insecurities and post the syndrome is big for men and women for different reasons, right? So and people kind of, people are always people. And so mm. a big part of executive coaching is to help a human being to realize full potential. It means we have to remove the title and look at the person. 
Mm. Because you and I use very different mediums to tell stories of in Asia, because I know you use a lot of LinkedIn, YouTube to tell these stories. And how do you foresee people moving forward? I think it's about describing those narratives that are very unknown, right? A lot of people, if you walk into the mass rapid transit or MRT, we call it the trains, you watch a lot of people basically watching 15 second YouTube videos and just click swipe, swipe, swipe. And how do you think of the role of this kind of digital media telling these stories moving forward. And especially professional people, I can see in Asia embracing it more and more. Like if we look, for example, what has been happening in the West, I mean, particularly America, the other part of the world, where all that has been booming and it's like at the top with marketing mm. and what's happening and, and online presence, that's kind of what has been leading the world. And I'm not saying it is good or bad. It depends how you use that, but it's a medium how you can get your voice out. And what I has been seeing, what is happening more and more, that people understand it now and they want to master this and they want to really leverage it. So there are more people who are no longer 20, 18 or 25, mm. but they may be 40, 50, 60. Yes. They realize they have to be on social media, actually, and they have to do it in a professional way. Maybe they even need to have a YouTube channel, and it's no longer for teenagers. You could have now a lot of professional YouTube channels with very professional content. You know, podcasts, right, becoming huge. Like I think, especially after the pandemic, the only joke about podcasts, what they say, there's a statistic for that. I think they say that more than 90% of the podcasts don't get past their either 10 or 20th episode. So there's mm. these statistics around it that often people think, oh, it's great, you know, I'm just going to talk to someone or talk about myself. I'm going to get a million followers and make tons of money with that. But then they realize actually how much work it is to be a content creator. So, you know, yeah. that requires a lot of, you know this, right? I mean, you could have been doing it for years. It requires tremendous discipline and consistency to be able to pull it off. So all of this is developing. And I also see LinkedIn becoming sort of now more in the leading way. So Facebook used to be, but now with everything that has been happening with Facebook, it's sort of, I mean, people mm. are still there, but I would say those who has been there uh, earlier are still leveraging it. However, right now, I'm not sure I would personally recommend for people to go on Facebook if you want to sort of progress in life and your career. Better go mm. to LinkedIn, right? Mm. So, so LinkedIn becoming a bit more social and also it is not as uptight as it mm. used to be 10 years ago. So it is oh, also yeah. becoming a bit more life focused and people like that. That's why it's becoming more popular. So there are some professional posts and there are some family posts. It's all mixed. Mm. And I think while people like it because you get to see person from different angles of life, so you can actually form like a better understanding. So not just mm. a, a business information. So LinkedIn mm. is definitely booming. I would say that it's developing very, very well. And just in general, online presence, especially after the pandemic, seems to be uh, very important. And what they say that you are what internet says you are. So that's why it's so just important to very consciously build the brands that you want to have. Mm. And I think the challenge is also for content creators. I don't know about you, probably you might have better distribution to be able to get more audience. I think distribution is one of the understated talking yes. to fellow Asian podcasters as well. Yeah. Yes. And this is actually a great topic. And I think let me just spend a moment, you know, talking mm. about it because I do see this as a very big issue. And in fact, I even saw people sort of watching me, right, starting my shows and I have a podcast and a talk show. So I actually have two shows, which I'm managing and producing. Mm. And people are, oh, Yana doing good. It must be, you know, great and easy. Look at all those views and followers. And they mm. start. And after six, 12 months, many give up. So I have seen it in my surroundings, exactly what you yep. said, for this particular reason that you said. So it's not even, even though the production is difficult, because you still have to find the way to do this. It has to be professional enough. I mean, there are, especially if you also do videos, you know, it, mm. it, it, it's, there are many elements to this. But then once the product is there, often people think, okay, I made it. So here I have an amazing product. All that they have to do, I just upload it. And that the gods of the internet and algorithm somehow magically going to pick it up and I'm going to be a success overnight. 
Mm. Almost never happens. Okay. So in my experience, so when we talk about content creation and actually really building an audience, I mean, one, it's definitely tenacity and consistency, like what you were doing, Bernard. You just have to be in a game long enough for people to trust you, you know, and, and they trust that you are there. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, you know, the second part is actually, it's, it's almost like a calculated success. I'm not sure if it's the right word to describe okay. it, but it means that you need to understand the algorithm. Like for example, and you also then, once you have um, a show or you have a content, you need to understand how you're going to get it out. And if you don't have this clarity, it's exactly what you say. It actually could be quite sad because the product could be amazing, but if there's no clear distribution, no one hears it, no one watches it, no one shares it. So you need to either do it yourself, or I would say, you know, maybe engage professionals who understand, but distribution is very important. And yeah. under distribution right here, I understand specifically understanding the algorithms. Like, I mean, I'm still learning, like I, I'm just... Now we're actually listening to one of their YouTube courses from one of very famous YouTuber just to understand YouTube algorithm better. How can mm. we fine tune, you know, the words and the editing and the thumbnails? And then also there's like a LinkedIn algorithm. Like you need to know what LinkedIn picks up That's and right. what it likes, right? There is mm. maybe no Instagram or TikTok if people use that. So you need to create content that is also uh, friendly for the particular algorithm. And I know it doesn't sound sort of very sexy, you know, but <laughs> it's the reality of yes. it. So. Yes. No, I'm <laughs> so glad you dive into detail on this. Like I talked to every podcast, I think probably the last out oh, of every new 10 shows that come out in Asia is typically, I know the podcaster and they usually ask me for, for advice at first. And, and then the first thing I probably just tell them that, yeah, it's great to create the content. I like the concept, everything. I actually encouraging them, go and do it, right? Don't bother about what everyone else say, just go and do it. And then the consensus at some point they will realize actually it's not so much of where they want to be, it's the distribution. And then I, and I keep telling them that I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I'm not even, can you imagine after nine, nine years of coming to 10 this year, I'm still thinking about distribution and not of course. any other things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, and I think we can always do better, right? And also if I just look, I mean, I, I totally understand with that. And, mm. you know, from my, if I sort of can add my two cents, you know, to this conversation <laughs> about distribution, what I learned myself over the journey and also watching other people who let's say became really good, specifically at distribution, mm. that usually it is those two things. So one, they either cracked the algorithm of a particular platform and they mm. focus on that, right? For example, they focus, let's say, only on YouTube, but the whole content then is optimized specifically for YouTube. Yep. Or they focused maybe only, I don't know, well, TikTok is not really long-term content, but right also, but it also has certain algorithm. So they focus only on TikTok and they optimize entire content for the TikTok. Podcasts, and I, like, I know it's probably sounding a bit sad, but everybody has been telling that actually podcast is the hardest with distribution, especially if the podcasts which are from Asia, like podcasts yeah. from the West, different because the audience is different. The audience is conditioned by many, many years already now to listen to the content. And in Asia, podcasts actually started coming only maybe within the last five years, really, like on, on a bigger scale. Before it was mm. just only numbers, right, here and there. Mm. And so I think also the audience is just becoming more mature and learning how to do that. But I can see it getting there more and more. So podcast is definitely, so with the podcast, I always say that it's the guests. So mm. one is the algorithm and yeah, the other the way, yeah. people, right? Yeah. So, and then, so you invite the guests who have network, who have mailing lists, who have communities, who can, you know, talk about their episode everywhere on social media, and then it becomes power of people. And that's how you distribute. <laughs> mm. So two of my favorite questions. The first one is, what's the one thing you learned about Asian change makers that very few do? Mm. Mm, such a great question. It's a tricky one. Mm. <laughs> I like that. Ah, softness that comes to me. Softness that people have inside of them. And often uh, when people talk about leadership, 
it's associated like with very, you know, strong, hard sort of qualities that you have to, you just have to be very hard in your decisions. And also you have to be hard as a person. And I think especially, again, if we often look at the Western leaders, that's the, the, the image that we, we are receiving, right, that we are seeing mm. there. And so when I talk with Asian change makers, underneath of all their success and all their titles and all their achievements, actually, mm. when they trust you and when they open up as people, I keep consistently seeing this quality of softness that there is almost like this gentleness for both men and women. That And this is, I find, it's very, what is the word for this? Encouraging. Maybe this is the word I'm trying to mm. look for because fundamentally it shows to me that we are all the same. And all humans, you know, have very similar desires and have very similar wish. I mean, everyone wants to be healthy. They love to be healthy and alive, right? We all want to be in a decent, safe society where we have opportunities to do what we want to do. I mean, it's very universal. And so I just find that uh, Asian change makers, they, those like soft leaders. And I really, I respect that a lot. Mm. So traditional closing question then. What does great look like for Yana TV? I love that. Well, let me begin. Mm. Okay, so I would like to have at least 10 million followers on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> so guys, please go on YouTube, you know, and check there Yana TV and support. And press the subscribe reason. button. Yeah. And press the subscribe button. Yes, because that I feel would actually make us what my vision is. I would like Yana TV to be the media platform that showcasing voices of Asian movers and shakers. And we expand in different varieties. Like we would have a YouTube channel. We would have a website, like a go-to, like, like, like Asia One, for example, right? Or Bloomberg. Mm. So like a go-to destination with different stories and articles and where people can read good news. I mean, that's the other thing. When we go into the media spectrum, there's a lot of really bad news and there's constantly disaster here and there. Because psychologically, it is proven already that fear and pain sells more than mm. any positive emotion. It's just true. That's why media leveraging yeah. on this so no, much. No, I agree with you. So, so that's uh, anything shocking usually statistically gets more clicks and shares than something just happy. And I would like to change this narrative. So I would like Yana TV to be this inspirational, uplifting format and platform where people actually go and they learn something. It's an edutainment format. So we're not lecturing anyone, but we're just giving through. That's why it's stories of people, right? So it's not just mm. lecturing in the camera. And it's fundamentally helping humans to connect across different cultures, different countries, different religions. And so we can all succeed together. So Yana, many thanks for coming on the show and really appreciate on sharing insights. And I think we have a pretty good conversation talking about change makers, talking about distribution, thinking about digital storytelling. Uh, so in closing, I have two quick questions. Uh, any recommendations that have inspired you recently? Yes, I would say time with yourself, removing all distractions. That's probably my biggest recommendation. So okay. I know you're probably expecting here a book or a podcast or, you know, something to do. And I would say don't do anything for five days and you will see you will have an amazing aha moment in an area which is important for you. How do my audience find you? Yana TV, you know, can you give the whole list? <laughs> yeah, I can give the whole list. Well, the first one, yes, YouTube. You just go and you search Yana TV and we are kind of right, you know, right there. And then the second also platform called Timeless Teachings Podcast. This is right mm. now available audio on Spotify, Google, iTunes. So you just go Timeless Teachings Podcast and there we talk more about human development and self-mastery with different experts and leaders all around the world. So that's mm. the other part which I would encourage everyone to go and check out. And if you want to connect with me personally, the best way is LinkedIn. So just go mm. to LinkedIn, Yana Frey, and send, you know, connect request or message and I would love to connect with you. Yes, and I'll definitely put those links in the show notes for everyone to come to connect you so they can get your 10 million number. So you can find this podcast across all channels and also YouTube and also subscribe to us on our newsletter as well and LinkedIn as well. So Yana, I mean, thanks for coming on the show and I look forward to speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Bernard.